Welcome to the Insightful Babes Podcast. We have created a new community for all the hustlers, dreamers, outsiders, and visionaries out there coming from Hispanic traditional beliefs. We've decided to share our entrepreneurship journey, our ups and downs, and hope to inspire, empower, and help others who are not being themselves because of fear or traditional beliefs. Maria Hinojosa dreamt of a space where she could create independent multimedia journalism that explores and gives critical voice to the diverse American experience. She made that dream a reality in 2010 when she created Futuro Media and the independent nonprofit newsroom based in Harlem, New York City, with the mission to create multimedia content from a PLC perspective. As anchor and executive producer of the Peabody award-winning show Latino USA, distributed by PRX and co-host the Futuro Media's awards-winning political podcast, In the Thick, Inojosa has informed millions about the changing cultural and political landscape in America and abroad. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Insightful Base podcast. Today, Maria and I are so excited. We have a legend in journalism. Her name is Maria Inojosa. How are you doing, Maria? I'm good. I'm good, mujeres. What's up? What's up? What's up? <laughs> ¿Cómo estás? Bienvenida en Saifo, babes. We're so happy to have you on here. I guess that's what I would have called myself in the 60s or so. No, not the 60s. I guess I would have called myself an insightful babe in the 80s. Although we didn't really use the term babe. We used the term fox. Ah, uh, huh. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> see, but see, you're, to you're a total insightful babe. And that's why we needed you to be on here. Because we're like, Mariano Hosa is such an insightful person. We need her. We need her right. at Insightful Babes. It was like, la tenemos, everybody. I know you guys are happy to have her on here and hear about her story, hear about her book that we're going to be talking about, which I'm also excited about that because I honestly recommend this book to anybody who wants to know about careers or um, culture, history, even also um, to be a voice. And that's also we're gonna that we're gonna talk about that as well. Is <laughs> it? <laughs> that was Walter going off for his walk. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we're all dog moms. Yeah. <laughs> Todos tenemos aquí nuestros dogs. Oh my God. I'm a new dog mom. This is the first dog I've ever had in my life. So it's a big change for me and I am so loving it. <laughs> is it what type of dog is it? I couldn't really. He's like a little chihuahua mini pincher. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's a little cutie. Yeah, a little cutie. Exactly. <laughs> See, oh, yeah, we every time we're recording, it's either my Chloe, who's a chihuahua, either bothering me or um, Harley, oh, right? yeah. <laughs> Harley barking over here, yeah. being a guard dog. <laughs> Love our dogs. Yeah. All righty, so let's jump right in. Is <clears throat> Maria, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Who is Maria Hinojosa? Well, I Maria Hinojosa is an immigrant, she's a Mexican born uh, woman who now lives in Harlem with her Afro-Dominican husband um, and her two Dominimex adult children. Um, I'm a journalist in my core, although I didn't grow up thinking I was going to do that because there were no Latina journalists um, that in, in U.S. media that I knew of when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. um, and I am... You know, I'm I'm uh, because I'm an immigrant. I actually have 16 different jobs, <laughs> like so many different jobs. So I have my own media company called Futuro Media. Um, I am an anchor uh, of two shows, uh, Latino USA and In the Thick. I'm a commentator on cable news, like places like MSNBC. Um, I'm a professor at Barnard College, which is my alma mater. Um, I used to travel around the country giving speeches. Don't do that anymore. <laughs> um, and I just published this book once I was used. So I guess that means I'm, I'm busy. Um, and I'm really loving life at this particular moment. See, see, and I honestly, every time that I see you, I see such passion towards what you do. And I absolutely love that. I love when people are so passionate about what they do, porque transmiten eso, you know, lo transmiten. Even though you're like maybe on social media showing it, you could still transmit that. It's, it's amazing. I actually, I actually think that's really important. Um, I mean, I have a lot of fun on social media, mostly on Instagram, as you know. 
but I am actually, I am trying to transmit a sense of finding joy. The last five years uh, have been particularly challenging, but that it, it didn't really start for me five years ago. Um, when you report on the kinds of things that I report on, mm-hmm. it, uh, you know, it, it, it takes an emotional toll. So, um, you know, I've ended up in a place where I really try to focus on joy and gratitude as much as I can, even though I'm faced with pretty, you know, difficult circumstances. Like today, I was in the middle of a meeting and I get a phone call from prison. You know, Estrella is calling me from prison. Estrella is um, a trans woman Mm -hmm. who is serving time in a maximum security men's prison in Texas. Uh, so, you know, when Estrella calls, it's like, okay, let's get to the reality of what's happening. She's in a prison, maximum security. Mm-hmm. Um, and even in our phone calls, we're trying to find joy. So that is, it is intentional. Um, so thank you for asking about that. Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay, Maria, so I want to know how you started being a voice in your life. I know Maria and I, <laughs> uh, both Marias. <laughs> Tocaya. 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 So um, I know Maria and I are just starting like our journey and it's taken some time and it's taken a lot of like effort and um, if I'm really introverted, I'm, you know, that shy, um, a little shy. So I know it's taken a, like a couple of tries for me to just kind of get out there. But um, how would you say that you started being a voice in your life and in your career? Well, like I write in Once I Was You, I think what was key for me was when I understood the privilege that I had. And to me, privilege doesn't mean that being wealthy because actually my dad was a medical doctor dedicated to research, so he didn't have a lot of money. Um, We didn't have a lot of money, but I did have privilege. Like I did end up going to a really good private high school after having gone to public school. And so then I was like, whoa, (laughs) these private schools, like, whoa. And then I was like, oh, well, I'm going to take advantage of all of this. Like they have a pool, like they have a theater, like, oh, I'm going to take advantage of this. And then, and then realizing like, oh, okay. So this privilege actually means that I have a sense of responsibility. So (laughs) that, that happened really in high school when I, when I started really understanding that um, I, I didn't want to be um, a, a kid who just took everything that I was experiencing at, for granted. I was like, I don't want to be that person who's like, oh, this I'm just taking. So I think that led me to the journey. And then when I got to college, <clears throat> um, I mean, it was the same thing. I was uh, a young Latina in the Ivy League. And uh, I was like, well, I'm, I mean, I'm going to do as much as I possibly can here. And part of what that led me to do was to to then work on the radio, the college radio, because I was like, well, I'm never going to get a chance to work on a radio station anyplace else. Let me do it here. And that that was the moment when, like you, mm-hmm. I would go on the air. I didn't know what I was doing per se. I was on a radio station that was heard 100 miles around New York City. Um, So there were tens of thousands of people listening, potentially at any time. And I was just doing it. Um, And I think at that point, when I became what we would call then a disc jockey, a DJ, Mm -hmm. is when I was like, oh, wow, people are calling into the radio station. And they're listening to what we're saying and they're interested in the fact that I'm interviewing these Latino and Latina artists and activists. And I think that was the clearest moment. I was like, oh, you do have a voice. Mm -hmm. You can use it to amplify our stories and people actually want to hear this. And um, and I think that solidified. Um, But by the way, it's a journey. Okay, that's the whole thing about um, writing about my imposter syndrome or my insecurities is that it, you know, it's, it, it doesn't happen overnight. It's all part of the process. So I really commend you for doing what you're doing because I see empezamos, you know, it's just like, okay, well, let me try this. I mean, that's the way you kind of have to do it. See, yeah. you know, and here at Insightful Babes, you know, we're always talking about being a voice, you know, and the importance of sharing our stories. Um, we grew up in a culture, right, where tradition is very important. 
And within that tradition, se nos ha enseñado, ¿verdad? Que especialmente nosotros los que somos de descendencia mexicana, se nos ha enseñado de no contar todo sobre ti, right? There are some spots, some things that you shouldn't be talking to others about. And I guess that's where it's so difficult for us to share our story. So I want to know, did you struggle with anything or did you bump into anything like that when you were writing this book? Because you were literally an open book and sharing everything. So, so when I knew that I was going to start writing this kind of work, I actually had a conversation with a great Chicana writer named Denise Chavez, mm -hmm. who wrote Face of an Angel. I wanna, she's just an amazing writer from New Mexico. And she had written a pretty revealing book, novel, actually. And I asked her that. I was like, we have said Like when I sit down and write, I know I'm going to have to write about these things that happen in my family. And sh and I don't know. And she said, ¿Sabes qué? When you sit down to write, you really can't be thinking about that. It may pop into your mind, but it really cannot be the primary thing on your mind as you're thinking. She was like, you just have to be truthful to yourself and to your experience. I I mean, look, this is hard. It's It's not easy. I know that I'm able to do this because... I've been doing it for so long. Like I, that voice that you asked me about, well, you know, that was in the 1980s when I was doing college radio. So I've been doing this for a while. I've been working on getting comfortable with owning my voice. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that has everything to do with how you end up writing a memoir like this. Like once I was you, um, <laughs> you cannot write a memoir and be half truthful. Mm-hmm. Like if you're writing about, you know, the way I was writing this uh, book, you know, I was like, okay, los recuerdos, what do I remember, what was the difficult stuff, you know, and that's where all of us as uh, as young women, you know, the whole issue of sex and sexuality and our vulnerability, our lack of conversation around this, all of this um, is a part of growing up, especially if you're Latina growing up in the United States. Right. It's a big part of the con. And so I was like, oh my God, well, I'm just writing about this because I just got to write about this. I, I mean, you know, when you write, you're not writing. I mean, I know I'm, I know my editor is going to see it, but I'm not writing thinking, well, everybody's going to read this version. Yeah. By the way, there was a lot that was in it that was quite intimate that got cut out. Um, <laughs> oh yeah. In fact, an entire boyfriend gone. Oh, <laughs> Uh, which was a really important part of my life because it he, he was not such a positive relationship. Um, and so he actually took up a lot of time and space in my life. And in the book, I was kind of working that out. Um, and then when we had to cut out 100,000 words, my editor, Michelle Herrera Mulligan, is just fabulous. And she she just did surgical. He was gone. He's gone from the story. And it's okay. Um, but... I just think that when you're writing like this, you cannot think about that filter. Mm -hmm. Having said that, not everybody can do it. I understand it's really challenging. Right. How do you deal with um, like any negative backlash from the book or, or anything negative that people might have to say? How do, you, how do you deal with that? Dude, I got to tell you, so far, backlash? No. Mm -hmm. Let me think for a minute. Damn a bit. Negative? No. Dude, wow. I, I feel like I'm going to curse myself. No, I'm no, like, no. I'm like, <laughs> like un segundo. has there been? <laughs> I mean, I really, I really can't say that, that there has been a kind of backlash at all. Mm -hmm. Or that I've gotten anything negative, per se. Which... You're the first people who've kind of asked me that. So I'm like, hmm. I mean, even today, I just got a message um, via my mother, via WhatsApp, because she's in Mexico, mm -hmm. uh, from a cousin. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, my God, mi primo's going to hate it. And no, and, he, and like my cousin, he wrote and he he loved it. So I think those, my, my family were, I'm I, I, actually the only little, not even backlash, but yes, una tía mía did say to me, mamá, Ay, pero ¿por qué hay tanto sexo? ¿Por qué? <laughs> and when she got on the phone with me when I was in Mexico two weeks ago and I called her, she's the grand aunt of all of us, and I said, Tía, ay, ay, Malulis, qué bonito tu libro. Ay, pero 
pues qué bueno que pudiste ser tan fuerte. She did not, could not say. Mm-hmm. You know, mijita querida, I'm, I'm so sorry that you, that you had, you know, that you lived through a rape. Yeah. That happened here in Mexico. She couldn't say the words. It was too much for her. But everything was like, you know, I'm glad that you survived. But that was the thing that she was most kind of focused on is that part. And I'm like, yes, I know it's uncomfortable. I know it's revealing. Mm-hmm. But I'm not going to participate in any more silence on this. I'm just not. Mm-hmm. And I think that's uh, important for you to share that because... Um, I don't know if it was, it was maybe your first time sharing that with your family or if they were already aware, aware of what had happened. But it's important because I know a lot of women go through it and they don't, you know, the way that you described it and it just like many women went through that. And I think that's important to share that. Let them know they're not alone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that that was definitely because I was not sure that that was going to happen. I was not sure that I was going to end up writing about that. I don't. I really didn't know, but when it was going to be included in the book, then I did actually, and that was before the pandemic, so I was able to visit with my mother, my sister, um, and and one of my brothers, and I had to tell them, look, this happened. Oh, they were so upset. (laughs) My My brother was like, what's his name? You know, and they went and they got all of the, you know, the family photographs. Actually, that moment was really important because... It, my family, my sister, you know, they were like, Perate, but wait, that that winter? You mean when we were there with that, with La Tia? And, and then they went and they started looking through all of the photographs. And it was in the process of that moment when there was a huge revelation for me. Mm-hmm. Because I had convinced myself that this happened to me when I was 17. Oh, okay. Like I had convinced myself. Mm-hmm. It happened to me when I was 16. I hadn't, I had just, mm. the, the way, you know, people are like, oh, that's impossible. You were, you know, how do you mean you're convinced yourself of something that isn't true? And it's like, yeah. it can happen. So it was a very important moment because my uh, my family was very sad. They wanted to do something. I was like, it's okay. Mm. Um, and then I was like, whoa, this is what trauma looks like. Same. Like for years, I was like, oh no, it happened when I was 17. And then therefore, I was like, well, it, it's, It's okay that it happened when it was I was 17 because that's the age that my mom was when she got married. Okay. I mean, what kind of logic is that? It's it's really crazy. But sadly, it was I was 16. He was 24. Mm-hmm. Okay. See, you know, and I feel that um, you haven't received any negativity because of how honest and truthful <clears throat> your story is, and you were being in your book. You know, you're not lying about anything. You decided to share your story to be a voice. And I guess that is why there's no negativity. And they, whoever comes up with negativity, it's just yeah. wrong, okay? Yeah. <laughs> wrong. Well, like I said, so far, I mean, for me, so far, none. What I'm hoping is that one of the things that I'm really loving is the way women, specifically Latinas, are definitely connecting with this book. Like, that's just like... Every time, like when you were just saying, oh, my God, Tokaya, you were like, you know, women are Latinas are really connected. I'm just like, oh, my God, that makes me feel so good. Yeah. It, it really does. I'm just hoping now that we expand that circle so that women, are, you know, black women, I've really I'm reaching out right now to the Vietnamese community because I write a lot about that experience mm-hmm. of being a young person and kind of living through the Vietnam refugee crisis. So I'm I'm expanding because I want it's. It, it is very much a Latina woman's story, for sure. But it's also an American woman's story, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Um, and so that's one of the things that I'm hoping to expand the audience, for mm-hmm. sure. Yes, and you really are. You really are. And we're so proud of you for everything that you've done. And I'm really, really happy that you decided to write this book. Um, but all righty, so let's get into a little more about your book. Um, there is a a memory, a a story where you share that, um, well, of course, your family is from Mexico, and you were born in Mexico, um, but your father was the first one to come over the U.S., and of course, it's a whole different lifestyle if you live in Mexico, and then you come to a new country with a whole different lifestyle, and something that really caught my eye, because I'm a border girl, um, and I had heard about these stories, but I had never really seen it in an actual book, Um, it was that when your father 
crossed, I don't know if it was in Bronzeville, Texas, or where he um, bumped into this, <clears throat> that when he wanted to go to the restroom, and he bumped into a white restroom and a black restroom, and he didn't know what which one to choose. Can you tell us a little bit about that? You know what? Actually, it may have been Brownsville. Mm. Ahora que lo pienso bien. Other side of Brownsville is Matamoros, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Correct. There's a very good chance that he was in Brownsville when he crossed and then got on the bus in Brownsville and the bus goes north into Texas and it makes a pit stop. And yeah, he has to go to the bathroom and he's like, ¿Qué es esto? In, you know, the, the world's most sophisticated country, mm -hmm. a modern democracy, an industrialized nation. And my dad is like, wait, am I white or am I colored? Mm -hmm. You know, and mi papá grew up in Tampico, la, la costa. He was brown for sure. He was definitely not white. He was not black. But in that moment, actually, that moment of writing, uh, my editor pushed me. Uh, Michelle Edera Mulligan pushed me. And it was actually one of those moments where I was like, wow, mi papá, like he did understand this notion of being erased from this country, of being invisible. I think he, there was a part of him that was like, híjole, if they can have this for black people, maybe one day they're going to have this for Mexicans. Mm. And if you think about what we're living through right now, I mean, there isn't a door that says Mexican, but, you know, everything but that, mm -hmm. right? Mexican being Latino, all Latinos and Latinas, right? Mm -hmm. Writ large. Um, so it really planted a seed of distrust about this country, which, by the way, just before you got on, I was ordering the Frederick Douglass book. Um, that's going to be one of my reads um, over the, the winter. Um, and... You know, Frederick Douglass had a lot of anger and distrust towards the United States of America. Mm -hmm. And the way he worked it out was he was like, well, that is the greatest sign of a patriot mm -hmm. is to have distrust mm -hmm. and criticism. So <clears throat> that's the way I kind of see my patriotism. And but I do think that for my father, it was like. It was it was a tough till pill to swallow because on the other side of that, my dad also his dream position in life, you know, to become a medical doctor dedicated to research to help to create the cochlear implant that would help people who couldn't hear if they wanted to to hear. Mm -hmm. um, that was his dream, um, and he made that happen. But the distrust was there, and I think it's something that Latinos and Latinas um, we have to talk about. Yeah, with love. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I even feel when when I read that part and he was describing how he must have felt. Sometimes it even like at times I if you go to certain areas wherever you live, there are certain areas that there's obviously going to be more Hispanics, but then there's more areas where there's more white people and or you know vice versa. But sometimes when I go to a certain areas and I feel like people are looking at me strange still, even in this time and age. So it is a little scary, you know, you, um, you come to another country wanting to start a new life and then you see something like this that you're like confused about, must have been. Well, I mean, you're talking to me from where, Mamita? You're in El Paso, am I right? Um, well, I'm from El Paso, but right now I'm in California. Ah, bueno, pues El Paso is always in your heart. Yeah. <laughs> and so we know about El Paso. Yeah. We know about... Like El, El Paso, you know, your home has been a laboratory for many things, but it was a laboratory for hate, you know, where we saw that. Oyeme, and that was a hate crime directed at Mexicans. Yeah. Straight up. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So my father, like many, you know, was was right. And that just means we have more responsibility to speak up, own our voice, take up space, do what you're doing. That's what we have to do. Yeah. There was um, there was a, a question, Diana, that you had um, about the time she des you described, Maria, in your book, that you felt like an outsider. <laughs> All the time. I know. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think for me it was the time where uh, you were describing like your younger self and 
when you were in school and you just couldn't eat and you felt like that, you know, like just that, that what you described, I was, I used to feel like that all through, all, honestly, all through like middle school, high school. And it just, it was something that I could relate to so much. And I was just, I just wanted to say thank you for sharing that because it was like, oh, I wasn't the only one that I felt like that. And, you know, I don't know, it just felt really good to hear that from somebody like you. Oh, thank you, Mamita. You know, when I was writing that, you know, the experience of going to a new high school and feeling like I didn't fit in and all of that, you know, pressure of not feeling good enough. And as I was writing, I was like, damn, girl, you were having panic attacks every morning. morning. <laughs> I didn't know we didn't have words for it. To, that's why I write about it, because I was like, I didn't know what was happening. I just knew that I, I, I was throwing up every morning and I didn't understand why. And I and it's it's interesting how, <clears throat> you know, when you don't have words for something, if you're lucky enough, you can find a way, you can find a way to resolve it, you know, re take care of it. But then, so I, I did that, right? Like that was definitely traumatic. Like I was having panic attacks. Like it, I was not telling my mother or my father or anybody about this because they probably would have said, hey, pero estás, ¿qué te pasa? Pero estás loca. Pero, o sea, they, because it's not like, oh, mijita, espérate, like, let me calm you down. Let me, you know, let's have some tea. Let's talk about this. No, it's interesting how I was able to come up with strategies. Actually, it was just like, you need to stop doing this. Mm -hmm. But I was able to survive through that. Also, like survive, you know, like dealing with, um, you know, surviving a rape. Like, you know, we didn't have the words for it. And I feel like I did survive this. Yes. But there are many of us who are in that same situation that don't, you know, that just like they can't, they can't pull out of the panic attacks in the morning. Mm -hmm. it, 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 and, and that's the part that worries me that, you know, um, not everybody can, not everybody does have the capacity to, as so, as it said, just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And that's, that's what worries me now. What would you say um, that really helped you? In what part of it? Um, in the whole, like, you didn't give up sort of thing. Whenever you were going through those panic attacks. Oh, my God. Uh, because, <laughs> I mean, I'm laughing about it because it was like, I mean, there was, there was, it, it was untenable. Hmm. I just knew I was not. I could not function mm -hmm. with throwing up every day. Like I was starving. <clears throat> it was going to require a lot of planning in my life. Like I would have had to like started taking, you know, food to have some, and you know, when you're in high school, you're like going from class. Like I would have had to come up with all kinds and I couldn't. So <laughs> That's where it's just like, I don't know what it was. It was like survival. It was like, es que sabes que? you can't, you just can't keep doing this. Yeah. yeah. Um, but again, I'm, I'm happy that I had the, I don't even know if I want to call it strength. It was like, I had some tools mm -hmm. to figure this out, but uh, there are a lot of young people, young women who don't have the tools. And that only, you know, it, I mean, like I'm watching the Princess Diana stuff right now. You know, she had bulimia. Bu her bulimia was brought on because of the extraordinary stress and anxiety. It's a weird manifestation, some people might think, but it exists. And many Latinas actually, I wouldn't call it an eating disorder. That's not what I had. I had a manifestation of anxiety. Mm -hmm. But again, I was able to take control of it a so many people cannot and that's where it's just like me da mucha pena but I was not I had to be honest and and so I'm really glad that you recognize that no I had to be like like at this point in my life no tengo pelos en la lengua la verdad mm -hmm. um Jane Fonda who actually <clears throat> as you know wrote a blurb for my book took a picture of herself with my book like I'm like okay Jane this is like amazing <laughs> um Jane Fonda recently was on her Instagram saying something like 
look, I'm 83 years old. Like, what are they going to do to me? Like, I'm, you know, I'm going to die soon. So what are they going to do? Kill me? She's like, that's why I'm not afraid of doing anything at this point. And I'm kind of like, I feel you. I mean, I'm not 83, but I'm not afraid, especially not afraid to talk about things. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I think um, we could all learn from that, you know, and, and as long as I feel like as long as you push yourself to be a voice and to, you know, because you never know the person that might be going through the same thing you are. And, you know, you help that other person, like just how you helped me, you know, relate to you. And I feel more at peace about even if it was years ago, then I thought I, okay, I thought I healed from that. But then when I heard you, like I read your book and I heard, I heard that I'm like, wow, you know, like I actually feel better now. Like I actually feel fully okay with oh, going through that. <laughs> I'm so glad. I can't remember if, um, did I include this stuff about my SATs? Maybe not. I can't remember. But, you know, <clears throat> I I had horrible scores on the SATs. Horrible. And that was another trauma that I just carried around for so long until I was like, nah, nah, nah me importa. Like, I did terribly on the SATs. Y que? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sí. Pues ya pasó, ya pasó. Ya pasó, ya pasó. Ya pasó. Ya pasó. Ya pasó. Ya No, and, you know, I... Like everything that you um, you have shared, it's so um, refreshing to know because it's you can actually see the importance of kind of finding those stories so that you know that you're not alone. Because at times we feel that we are alone. Like, ah, pues yo soy Latina or mi familia es esto, la tuya no. So I'm the only one, you know? But it's not true. Yeah, no. <clears throat> and the thing is, is that... Latinas, okay, very specifically Latinas, um, and we talked about this a bit in terms of how Latinas are really powerful consumers. So we really need to be running shit. Like we we, to, we need to be taking our cues from black women. Mm-hmm. We need to be taking our cues from black women in the sense that um, if following in their footsteps of having fear but moving through that fear, and owning our power. I mean, you know, Kamala is a black woman as the vice president. So, um, and you know, I'm very critical of all politicians. So it's not mm-hmm. like I'm gonna, you know, not be critical of them, but mm-hmm. it is, we we do have to kind of take our power here. That's why I think, you know, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is so interesting, right? Because um, she's kind of like, pues aquí estamos, you know, like we're just gonna jump in. And we, you, are going to be leading stuff. Our demographic is so powerful. Mm -hmm. We don't really feel that way in the mainstream. There's nothing that you can, you know, it's not like the New York Times. Let's just take the paper of record, which I love and hate them. Mm -hmm. But it's not like the New York Times was reporting about the power of the Latino vote like every week up until the election and saying on the front page, just in case you didn't know, Latinos are the second largest voting bloc in the entire United States. Yeah. Just to remind you, Latinos are the second largest voting bloc in the United States. And therefore, we need to be covering them every week, every day. All So, no, they didn't do that. And so we feel like, what's going on here? Like, we're invisible? Que no nos ven? Mm-hmm. You know? Um, and then we internalize that. And so everything that we, you, me, what we're trying to do is to push back on that. And um, we kind of have to. Like, that is, like that's, why I'm, that's why I'm here with you because um, I'm all about us just jumping into this space mm-hmm. and doing it because we have to. It's not just for us. It's for the next. And you all are leaders, of course, in your respective communities. You are leaders. Young Latinas look up to you already. Mm-hmm. They're like, híjole, pues mira, pusieron su micrófono, mi prima. <laughs> yeah. You know, whatever. <laughs> eh, mi vecina is now doing it. So, yeah, we are, um, we are that. And the more that we can encourage ourselves to own that, it's not just good for us. It's good for the entire country, frankly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we can be a voice for the voiceless. You know, sometimes that's what we have to be. Yeah, I like. I used to use that term a lot. Uh, voice for the voiceless. I think it's a. It's it, it captures something, but in many ways they are not voiceless. They're just unheard. 
Yeah. Right. So we come the vo- we can become the voice for the unheard. Mm-hmm. They are speaking. They have a voice. Just people aren't listening to them, right? People are dismissing them, right? They're just choosing not to listen to them. Yeah, exactly. Literally. Literally. <laughs> um how do you feel about you know in in your book you did touch up on um not feeling like when you go to mexico you don't feel mexican enough and then when you're here in the united states you don't feel american enough so how do you um i want to touch up like talk about that so i just got back from mexico two weeks ago um and i would say i mean i didn't go anywhere like i was in my mom's home no salimos para nada Mm-hmm. Uh, we did go out once to a plant nursery so that she could buy her noche buenas for her house. Yeah. That was the only time that I was out. And as I was out, and this is like two hours outside of Mexico City, and I was looking around, and I was like, actually, you know, there were uh, there were Chinese people who were there. Mm-hmm. There were Japanese Am I, I was like, are they Japanese, Mexican, Chinese, Mexican? Looks like. Mm-hmm. Uh, did I see any black folks? No, I didn't see any black folks. But I was like, oh, I completely, like, I'm jiving here. Like, I don't, you know, there's a whole thing that's happened in Mexico. Mm, I mean, it's not great, but the truth is, is that millions of people have been deported. Mm. Millions have gone back into Mexico. Entonces, many of... Uh, nuestros compatriotas are speaking English in Mexico and así se manejan and it's it's less of a thing the way it used to be like oh my god they're speaking English no yeah so the way I understood it was that this is actually our superpower our capacity to feel ni de aquí ni de allá Mm -hmm. is our superpower the fact that in our brains we can be like processing like damn i don't i don't feel like like i'm i'm going between two that is the thing that makes us extraordinary not the fact that we don't feel like we fit in in either place so i'm all about taking a narrative and flipping it to a power narrative okay and so it's like no man we're the coolest people because we don't feel like we fit in any place yeah that's the bomb. Mm-hmm. And so then you can look at our Mexicanos. By the way, I'm from Mexico City and Chilangos. I don't know if you know this, but Chilangos are very arrogant. <laughs> yeah. um, entonces, uh, I'm like, yeah, no, arrogant right back at you. Like, yeah. mm-hmm. <laughs> So I, I just really feel like it's a lot of our head too and that if we – uh, if we move in the world like, oh, my God, um, I'm going to give you the power to look down on me because I'm not Mexican enough, then you're giving away your power. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm no, nah, I had a great time. I mean, the thing that is hard, the truth, the truth, truth, truth. I wish I could cook more. Aww. Naturalmente Mexicano. Like, that is the thing that is really hard for me. Like, I wish I could be one of those Mexican moms. It's like, I know the problem. Uh, no te preocupes, ahorita hago una sopa seca. Uh, you know, I no te preocupes, ahorita, I mean, I can make quesadillas. I made bomb quesadillas. I can make great um, guacamole. You know, I'm really good at chilaquiles. You know, I can do certain things, but I really wish that I could be like that Mexican mom who could cook. That would be the only thing that I'm like, I wish. I can keep dreaming, though. <laughs> yeah, and trying, and trying. And trying. <laughs> Yeah. 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 I love that about our, our Mexican moms, you know, that they're so caring and like, oh, se les ocurre algo de que, ah, vamos a hacer esto. Okay, sí, lo saben hacer, you know? <laughs> like, whoa, you know, like sometimes I see my mom and she's already cooking. I'm like, ¿qué haces, ma? You know, like she's super quick on thinking, okay, hoy vamos a hacer esto. I was like, oh, I was just thinking about buying, you know, delivery. <laughs> yeah, right. Ordering. No, la verdad es que I, and, and we really have to champion them. My mom um, cooked a fresh meal for six people every single night yeah. for a year. I mean, we did not order out. This was ordering out. No, that was for rich people. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, you know, we going to McDonald's was not. First of all, they, my parents didn't really. I mean, if you remember back then, 
Mexicans actually hated McDonald's. I don't know if you remember this, but Mexico actually, there was no McDonald's in Mexico famously. Um, and so that was like a, a special thing. We did not, you know, there was no prepared food. I mean, if my mom opened a can of, what are they called? SpaghettiOs? It was like a big treat. It was like, oh my God, we're getting SpaghettiOs because everything was made by hand. Can you imagine making a fresh meal for six people every I single night? <laughs> I'm like, whoa. I know. So, yeah, so we got to give our praise. Um, and, and I think that, you know, one of the things that happened in the writing of Once I Was You is I really came to terms with like power Mexican women and just like, wait a second. Yeah, no, I didn't see any Latinas or women in the United States doing journalism. But I did see... Mexican women in Mexico being journalists. Yeah. That's what inspired me. So, so in many ways, Mexico was more advanced than the United States. And Mexican women, even though there is this whole, oh, you know, we're virginal and we're respetuosas and we're calladitas and all that. Yeah, well, you know what? What about las soldaderas or las adelitas? They were revolutionaries. What about Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, who was a rebel in the 1500s? What about, um, you know, Jovita Idar from El Paso, you know, great journalist um, in the early 1900s uh, who was a badass? Um, what about Frida Kahlo, you know, who was openly bisexual and a communist? So Mexican women, actually, our, our panoply of who we are is much broader than we give ourselves credit for. And I'm trying to put that out there. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you're doing a really good job at putting that out there because just even reading your book, I felt already inspired and more empowered to actually, you know, follow follow along and do just continue being a voice and continue to actually, I mean, it is kind of scary sometimes, but just try to, even if you're scared, just keep going, you know, and try to not live out of fear. And Yeah, exactly. I mean, I understand this. I was scared all the time. You know, my husband would joke that when I was a new correspondent at NPR, the first Latina, and I had to write my stories, you know, which were like five minutes or seven minutes long. He was like, oh, my God, you don't get PMS. You get PSS, <laughs> pre-story pre syndrome, you know, and I'd get scared. So fear is everywhere. I mean, la verdad, la verdad, right now, of course, there are things that I'm afraid of. I mean... You know, que le pase algo a mi familia o mi mamá. Eh, I mean, of course, I'm. I don't want to see that, but, but I don't. I I'm really thankful that I, the I've eaten a lot of the fear. Yeah. Uh, and it took me a lot of decades. So that is, I am kind of putting it out there, which is, you know, to be stuck in our sphere in our fear just doesn't serve us. It just doesn't. I I really look to Sonia Sotomayor. Um, you know, who's on the Supreme Court uh, and, you know, who grew up in the South Bronx with an alcoholic father, being a diabetic, you know, all these things, didn't know how to dance salsa as a Puerto Rican, hello, <laughs> you know. And she said, you know, oftentimes the first act of discrimination that Latinos or Latinas will face is going to be ourselves. It's going to be discriminating against ourselves and saying, oh, we can't do that. I could never do that. And that's why I love what you did, which is, no, we can. We're going to try. Oye, me tengo miedo. Pero, bueno, ahí vamos. Como decimos, paso a pasito. O pasito a pasito. Pasito a pasito, you know. And and in that sense, yeah, remember our abuelitas and our bisabuelas and our grand and our mothers. Like the kind of chaos that they have survived through. Mm -hmm. So we can't be in fear. They They survived through some serious stuff. Yeah. And so, yeah, we cannot give in to our fear. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you mentioned in your book that you suffered from imposter syndrome, which back then nobody <laughs> knew what it was, right? How did you manage with that? Well, when the imposter syndrome really, like, was, I was able to manifest it and talk about it was by now I was um, in therapy. I had taken a job at NPR as the first Latina correspondent. And I remember seeing my therapist Andaye and just saying to her, oh my God, they're gonna find out. And she's like, what do you, 
what do you mean they're going to find out? I'm going to say, oh, my God. Se van a dar cuenta de que I really can't write. Again, every script, it was like, oh, my God, I can't do this. I can't do this. Um, and I, you know, she really, she helped me to begin to recognize, like, well, so what is your greatest fear? My greatest fear, you know, I had a recurring nightmare of an elevator falling. That was the way my imposter syndrome manifested. I, I haven't had that nightmare in a long time, like long, long, long time, but used to be kind of often. And she would say, okay, let's just say that you're in that elevator and it dips mm. and you fall with the elevator. Okay. You've fallen, you've survived. You're down on the ground. What are you going to do? And I was like, what are you talking about? She's like, okay, you're in the elevator. You've fallen. You've hit the ground, but you survived. What are you going to do? And I was like, um, get up. And she was like, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so I think she began to give me tools for like, you know, ways to understand that the imposter syndrome was going to be with me. Um, but that it, it, there was no way that I could just let it tumbar me that, um, and I, my husband was essential in all of this. I mean, Herman was just really, really fundamental in helping me to power through this. Um, and it takes a long time, which is why I want to talk about it because I don't want other women and other Latinas to be stuck here. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't oh, it doesn't go away 100%, yeah. you know, and that's why I still ask everyone who I interview, so how do you deal with that little voice? And, you know, even somebody as prolific as Rita Moreno, you know, the Emmy Grammy, Oscar, Tony, Peabody Award winner, mm -hmm. star of One Day at a Time, West Side Story, you know, like amazing. Uh, and, and when I interviewed her a few years back, I've interviewed her on a number of occasions, and I said, Vos, ¿qué haces cuando aparece esa vocecita? And she said, I know. La mando de castigo a su cuarto. <laughs> and so thinking that even Rita Moreno has that little voice of doubt, I'm like, all right. And so we get you know, understand the tools to conquer it. And I think a big part of it is talking about it for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So do you have a favorite teacher? No hay mal que por bien no venga. Uh -huh. <clears throat> I love it. I mean, these days, recently, up uh, because of the election, I was like, hasta no ver, no creer, you know, <laughs> until I see the transfer of power. I'm not, but I, I, no hay mal que por bien no venga is, I think, the one that I, use a lot mm -hmm. did someone share that with you or did you just like it no i think you know mi abuelita mi mama mm -hmm. um that's a good question like i'll have to think back like when did i first hear it i don't know but i remember when i understood that i was like yeah that's that's <laughs> fine i got that i love it i do yeah well, we love it. We love it. And for everyone tuning in, if you guys haven't read Maria's book, go and get it, especially in the local local business, local library. Go for it. Um, let's support local businesses out there. And Maria, thank you so, so much for allowing us to have you here on Insightful Babes. It was a pleasure for Diana and me to interview you and to hear your story here. Este, muchas gracias. Muchas, muchas gracias. No, I'm... I'm thrilled to be with you. Sorry that I'm not looking like much of a babe this morning, but, um, uh, you know, I, I, I work out every morning at seven o'clock. I'm in the park boxing and dancing. Um, and this morning, uh, I went straight from my workout at 8 AM to have breakfast in a restaurant, the first restaurant that I've been in, a cafe, mm -hmm. um, with one of my oldest buddies. He's actually in once I was you, his name is David Hershey Webb. Um, he's one of my oldest buddies from Columbia University. And, and and then I've literally been in meetings ever since. So you're seeing the workout, Maria, with her little gym clothes. <laughs> I love it. Uh, but it's the workout at 37 degrees. So I was wearing multiple layers on, you know. Yeah. Um, but I, I do have a lot of fun on Instagram, um, kind of trying to inspire people to do that. Um, I've been listening to a lot of meditations on self-love. Yeah. And and taking care of ourselves, like, you know, sleeping, working out. Okay, truth be told, um, today I, I'm not going to eat a very good 
lunch because my son just said that my husband picked up a slice of New York pizza for me. Ooh. So I'm sorry about that. <laughs> but, um, but other than that, yeah, a lot of self love. And so I'm really proud of the work that you're doing. And, you know, when you're ready to talk more about the book, have me back on. And for those of you who do have the book, um, you know how to get in touch with um, my assistant, Lily La Pescadita on Instagram or on Twitter and let, um, let us know. I, I can send you a signed book yes. plate. Uh, I was wondering, sticker. how are we going to make this happen? I need yeah. the <laughs> Yeah. So just get in touch with Lily and little by little, I'm sending her the signed stickers Mm -hmm. you know, if we can dedicate and then we'll get them out to you. I mean, we're doing it ourselves, not Simon and Schuster. This is just <laughs> me and Lily making sure that we, you know, continue with the love for, for once I was you. Truth be told, I wanted to become a bestseller. We got to sell 5,000 copies of the book. That doesn't seem like a lot, but actually it's a lot. So, you know, literally every granito, I'm like, okay, we're getting closer. We're getting closer. <laughs> Yeah, because we're trying to prove something to the publishers, right? We're trying to prove something that a book like this will have that kind of traction with the audience. So I really appreciate all the love and support that you're giving for Once I Was You. It, it means a lot to me. Of course. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you so much. Y pues bueno, ahí la tienen. Ladies mm -hmm. and gentlemen, thank you so much, Maria, again. Mi tocaya. Este, <laughs> looking forward to see what else it is that you're going to accomplish because you're incredibly amazing and such an insightful babe yeah fox insightful, insightful fox insightful you're gonna fox. have to label this maria Inosa insightful fox yeah. <laughs> everybody's gonna be like what what's going on here <laughs> i love that i love foxy it's a very great 19 yeah. kind of term so i'll take insightful babe insightful fox it was great talking to the both of you and thank you for all you do bye thank you Thank you for tuning in to our Insightful Babes podcast. Make sure to stay tuned for more of our special guest episodes, Cheese Time episodes, and more.